Grab a cup of tea or listen as you go, ladies. This is your hour with Dr. Zoe, your life and relationship coach, with encouragement, on point insight, inspiring guests, health tips, and advice. Dr. Zoe helps busy women keep their mind in the game by redefining your superwoman. You're listening to The Dr. Zoe Show. Hey there, welcome to The Dr. Zoe Show. I'm your host, Dr. Zoe. I'm a licensed psychotherapist with a doctor in clinical psychology. I'm a life and relationship coach and a motivational speaker, and I can work with you virtually to help you get unstuck. Connect with me by texting the word JOIN to 38470. Today is a guest episode, and my guest is Julie Graham, the Julie Graham on Instagram. She's co-host of This Grit and Grace Life podcast, and she's the social media maven, I think I kind of made that word up, or the title, for the Grit and Grace Project online women's magazine. Many of you know that I host an Ask Dr. Zoe column there at the Grit and Grace Project, where I answer questions from listeners and readers. I hope that you have checked it out. Please go check out the Grit and Grace Project magazine and this Grit and Grace Life podcast. I read the magazine regularly. I listen to their podcasts. I get so much from them. They really talk about the same things that I do about redefining what strength is for a woman. So for those of you who don't know Julie, she's a mama of one. She's a young widow. She recently competed in a fitness competition, which takes a lot of guts, y'all. She is quite amazing. I am crazy inspired, especially by this competition. A little inkling of me is like, maybe I should try. Yeah, no, 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 no. I don't need another thing on my list, but I'm so impressed that she did that. So she's an amazing, strong woman of grit and grace. And I also know that from Julie's story, she has a book in her. It's not out yet. I don't think she's even started reading it, but I will continue to kind of nudge her The girl's got a book, so I hope when it is out, we'll definitely have her back on and uh, you guys will be reading it. So I wanted to bring her on today as a snapshot of a woman of strength, also highlighting that we don't always recognize the qualities in us that create strength. As I talked to Julie about her story, some of it probably hasn't even always been clear to her, but what I know is that no one gains strength unless you've been through a struggle. In order to be a strong woman, you have to go through some struggle. Now, we can all go through struggles and still not gain strength. We have to be intentional about it. And that's really why I have this podcast is to be intentional about gaining strength as a woman as we go about life's journey, which is going to have its pits and, you know, its ups and downs, everything. A woman said to me on Instagram once that real strong women don't just go around feeling strong or talking about how strong they are. They're just living. And I think to some extent that's true, but I'm an academic at heart. I'm a bit of a researcher. And so I want to know what makes you strong. I want to know what are the components. And so that's a lot of what I talk about. And I have been delving more into what a truly strong woman is, not what we create and talk about in society, but what is a truly strong woman. So I'm excited to talk to Julie and just hear a little bit about her story. So for my win and fail, I'm going to be super fast because it's a long episode. I'm just going to talk about my win. I said no. I am still holding to the no challenge. I hope many of you guys are doing the month-long no challenge. I had a very, very dear close friend, love her, ask me to do something for her. And I said, no, I felt a lot of things about it. (laughs) And I walked myself through all those feelings and I said, no, anyway, and I am so happy. And it turned out so great. She loves me. So of course she's not going to be upset or mad or anything. And you know what? Honestly, even if she was, that's okay too. So my win is that I said no, and I feel great about it. And Julie's going to share her wins and fails in just a minute. Listen up for Julie Graham. Julie, I am so thrilled that you are on the show today. Me too. Thanks for having me. Of course. I'm excited for my listeners to just hear your story and get inspired and motivated by it. So before we get started, you've got to share your superwoman win and your superwoman fail. Please do. By the way, I'm seeing you on video and looking at your chiseled arms. So happy for you. (laughs) Oh, you're sweet. 
Oh, that's so funny. Well, that will kind of be in my win and fail. Also, this is so fun that we're recording with video and all of the shows we've done together before. We've never done that. So that's fun. So my win is that I'm a single mom and my son Lincoln started kindergarten this week. Hmm. We did it. We made you it did to school. It. Yay. <laughs> like literally he made it to school in general and he made it to school every day. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Every day so far. On time? Yes, early. Good for you. I was the oh. first one to his class on the oh, first day of school. That's awesome. I walked in and I was like, wait, I'm first? Did I do something wrong? <laughs> No, I guess I just slayed. I don't know. Yeah. You so that's my win. But my fail is because it was the chaos of the first week of school and I'm juggling the rest of single mom life. And as you alluded to my arms, I'm currently um, training for a bikini fitness competition. Mm-hmm. My first ever that I accidentally fell into. And it is a lot of work and a lot of time. And so I kind of underestimated how much time it was going to be and then yeah. adding in school pickup and drop off and working and all of the things. And so this week I have felt really just like I am flying by the seat of my pants and I'm checking to make sure I have pants. You know what I'm saying? I get it. Yes, <laughs> I do. That's a lot going on there. And you've, yeah. you accidentally fell into bikini contest? <laughs> I did. I, I really did. It did. It was not my intention. I was trying to convince one of my best friends to do it because uh-huh. she had confessed in front of me that she had kind of always wanted to do it. And she's got the body type that give her a month or two, she could probably win. Mm-hmm. So I kept saying, just do it, just do it. And then she finally turned to me and said, well, if you do it, I'll do it. Uh, you can't say that to me. <laughs> then I have to do it. She so, challenged you. Yeah. Yep. So I am halfway through my training. I've been training for about three months and it's about two and a half months away. So best of luck. Thanks. Yeah. I'm excited and nervous and all the things. That's what you should be. Competition's good though. It's the best motivator. It really is. I mean, you never would have done any of this stuff if you hadn't had the competition. And and I wouldn't be doing if I wasn't doing it with my friend. Like this Uh, week, especially when everything was just getting crazy, she and I FaceTimed each other and we just said, I would have quit by now if it wasn't for you. Like for sure. So I totally get it. Yep. I have a running partner, so I understand. Totally. So let's dive into your story. Can you tell my listeners just, I mean, you've had a whirlwind of a life really, but can you just share your story with us? Yeah, I was thinking about it earlier, just trying to prepare for this. And there's definitely a lot of trauma and trials, mm-hmm. tragedy in my life, but I also feel like there's been a lot of triumph too. So it would be an honor to share with your listeners about my life. So I actually am the middle daughter of three sisters and both my mom and my dad were teenagers and drug addicts um, when they had all of us. And so we were not raised by our biological parents. Um, Mm -hmm. In fact, I have never even met my biological father. It's on my life bucket list, but Mm. it keeps getting moved down, I kind of forget to do it. So my younger sister and I were raised by our great grandmother on our mom's side. Uh Your maternal grandmother. Yeah. Yep. My older sister was separated from us because she's four years older. And so our grandmother had kind of already been raising her and Hmm. become a parent that my mom wasn't going to clean up her act, Mm -hmm. you know, get her kids and be able to take care of us. Now, you know, to kind of set the stage, my mom had my older sister when she was 14. And then I came along when she was 18. And then a year later, my little sister was born. So she was 19 and had three kids Mm -hmm. with her drug dealer. I mean, let's just call it what it is. He went on to jail shortly Mm -hmm. after my little sister was born and pretty much spent, I think most of my childhood in jail. And so my mom just wasn't able to take care of us and her mom was taking care of us. And by the time I was three and my little sister was two and my older sister was seven, it was just too much for my grandmother to handle. She honestly just didn't want the responsibility of all of us. Mm -hmm. And so she asked her mother-in-law, so my great grandmother, if she'd be willing to take um, my younger sister and I for a couple weeks while the family figured out who was going to watch us. Wow. We were shipped off to Florida two weeks later and that's where we remained. There really wasn't a backup plan. So we, my younger sister and I, Katie and I moved in with our great grandparents who were obviously retirement age at the time. And thought they were only going to have you for two weeks. Exactly. Two weeks. My goodness. And the truth is, is, you know, my great grandmother who raised me, we called her granny. That makes Uh it easier. So granny was, I think she was 67 when she took us and Papa, my great grandfather, I think he was already 80 
wow. or 78. He was older mm-hmm. and he had no legs. So she had a lot on her plate when she took she us did. in. She did, my gosh. And he died a couple of years later. And so then it was just the three of us. And it quickly became obvious that we were too much for her. Mm-hmm. Understandably so. Right. Of course. That's a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm struggling with my five-year-old. <laughs> yeah. You know, I can't imagine having two toddlers. Yeah. I mean, you can see it from her point of view and see she didn't even mean to have you guys. She was going to keep you for a couple of weeks. And next thing she knows, she's raising two girls, which must have been horribly overwhelming and stressful. But from a kid's point of view, you just needed love. You just needed to be taken care of. And you can't get any of that (laughs) from a kid's point of view. So that must have shaped your childhood. For sure. Because You know, I think for the first year or two, it was okay. She actually had her daughter come and live with us after Papa died to kind of help. Mm-hmm. And there was a couple of years where that was good. It was it was healthy. We kind of acted like a family unit. So my great grandmother, my sister, my great aunt and her son, he also moved in with us and he was four years older than me. And so there was probably a two or three year period where it was pretty normal. I have, I have some good memories of that span of time. Mm-hmm. But once my cousin started getting a little bit older, he kind of tried to step into the man of the house role. And it really just became unhealthy for everyone. He was verbally and emotionally and physically tempted, sexually abusive Mm -hmm. to both myself and my sister and emotionally and verbally abusive to both my grandmother and his mom. And so it was just a very hostile home environment. And I just remember always being confused as to why he was allowed to kind of step into that man of the house position. And I also really remember feeling like it was granny's job to protect us and she wasn't doing it. And I could see that she regretted taking us in. And in fact, she would tell us often that she Mm -hmm. wished she hadn't had us and that she could send us back. Mm -hmm. She could call, you know, DCFS at any minute and they'd pick us up. And so I just remember being told those things my whole childhood that I wasn't wanted, that I could be returned for lack of a better word. Or taken away to some mysterious place. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Taken away. And also that I was going to turn out like my mom. Mm-hmm. I was told probably inappropriately at a young age why I lived there and what my mom had done and that I was going to turn out just like her. And so those were kind of some of those repeating stories I was told as a child. And all the while, I kind of fell into that middle child syndrome where I could tell that what my cousin was doing was wrong. Mm-hmm. But the grownups in the house weren't trying to correct it. And so mm-hmm. I tried to protect my baby sister and I tried to stand up to him. And it was all just emotionally exhausting. But it also made me a fighter, mm-hmm. if I'm being honest. Well, that's what I wanted to hear about, too, is, is how that has shaped who you are today and how you've dealt with the things that have happened subsequently. So flash forward. We're going to go forward here. You get married. I did. I did. Mm -hmm. So things got crazy in my high school years in the house that I was in. And I just got to a point where I couldn't stay there anymore. Mm -hmm. So I moved out and I stayed local to go to college because I had a really good church that I got connected in, which praise the Lord. Um, Mm -hmm. At a young age, I was connected to a church and people in my church really kind of took me under their wing and kind of were that supportive outside family environment for me. And so when it was time for me to graduate high school, you know, I had left granny's home kind of on bad terms and I didn't feel like I could go off and go to school somewhere right. where I would have to start over. And so I stayed local and went to college and got connected into a church. And in my first year of college, I met, I met Paul and I remember quickly, he mentioned that he was a Christian and I was for the first time in my life, really taking my faith seriously. I had gotten involved in the college ministry mm-hmm. at the school where I was going and some of my leadership qualities had started to show and I was just really excited about my faith. And so for the first time I'm being, you know, pursued by a guy who's a Christian and Mm -hmm. that's now for the first time important in my life. And so I remember thinking, well, I'm not really that into him. And I actually probably need a little bit of a break from boys. In fact, I had just said I was taking a break from boys before I met him, Mm -hmm. but he was a nice guy. And I didn't want the Christian guy to feel bad about the fact that he'd finally worked up the courage to ask me out after legitimately basically stalking me for a year. He'd been watching (laughs) me for a while. He always loved to tell that story. So I went out with him and, you know, continued going out with him. And I told him I wasn't looking for a relationship and Again, he'd been watching me for a year, so he'd pretty much already decided he wanted to marry me. So he was willing to unofficially date me for as long as it took for me to be okay with the fact that, okay, fine, we can date. And, you know, within a few months, we were seriously dating and dated through the rest of my college years and got married 
a week after I graduated college. Mm -hmm. I was 21 when we got married, turned 22 on our honeymoon after dating for three years. And I look back now and I realize that not having a dad growing up really played a significant role in my choices for who I dated. My standards were pretty low. Mm -hmm. I can see now as a grown woman that really anyone who would give me attention, that was kind of like the first bar. And anyone who had what seemed like a strong family life. If he would give me attention and he had a family that I could kind of assimilate into, I was in. That was way better than you had in in some ways, all of your dreams. So of course, yeah. Totally. And Paul was a great guy. But, you know, looking back now, I can see that he was a Christian and he had a good job. He actually had his own business. So he made pretty good money. And even though we dated for three years, there was a point about a year in where, you know, he wasn't really pursuing his faith anymore. And I was continuing to pursue my faith more and Mm -hmm. more. And some red flags had started to show up in our relationship. This was before you guys got married? Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Okay. So you saw the flags before you got married, but... Oh, yeah. Oh, still they were married waving. Him. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. They were waving, and I ignored them mm-hmm. because I craved security of a relationship. Right. You know, and there were lots of great things about him, but there were some really, you know, unsettling things that were not healthy for him and for me, but I overlooked them for the mm-hmm. sake of being with someone. So we got married, and... Honestly, within the first couple months, I realized that getting married didn't fix it. Mm -hmm. I think sometime, hopefully I'm not the only one. You probably know from your professional experience that I'm probably not the only woman who thinks it'll all even out once we get married. Yes. When on my side too, I had like the Christian, like once we start having sex, you know, because we're doing all the right things, like everything will just even out and be fine and healthy and good. Mm -hmm. That definitely didn't happen. You know, there's that saying that. When men get married, they expect that their wife won't change, and they do. And when women get married, they expect they'll change their husband, and he doesn't. Oh, my gosh. That's so true. I said it a little off, but that's the basis of the statement. Yeah, and it is true. Pretty much. So here we are married. You know, and one of the things that was really hard for my husband is he struggled with significant anxiety and depression. Mm-hmm. Really, it started as anxiety. And I knew that he had anxiety, but I didn't know until I was living with him how significant it was. And it was significant. You know, he mm-hmm. would have a hard time driving home from work without stopping multiple times to go back and retrace, you know, parts of the road where he couldn't remember the lane change and maybe he ran somebody off the road and killed them and the cops Mm. are going to be looking for him. So that was significant. Right. And my heart really hurt for him. I begged him to get some help and consider, you know, doing medication and things like that to help because I knew it was really abnormal. And so early on, I really asked him to get help and he, he really just chose not to. And were there other things going on in your marriage besides just his anxiety? Yeah, I mean, for sure. I can see looking back that because it wasn't healthy to begin with, he very much turned to his business was everything. And so he isolated from relationships and threw himself into his work. And so we didn't spend a lot of connected time together. And then the stress of him having his own business coupled with his crippling anxiety it made him very harsh and short with me. Mm -hmm. And instead of figuring out how to communicate in a healthy way, I just learned to not say very much. I decided it was my responsibility to keep everything really peaceful. I wasn't sure what he was going to come home like. And so I wanted to prevent him from having any worse of a day than he probably already had. And so I recognize now that I became the peacemaker and I went out of my way to try to make his life easier. And the more I tried to make his life easier, it seemed like the more his life got more complicated. He started turning to drinking really heavily, which really began to make me uncomfortable. And there were multiple times where I would come to him and, you know, just say, your drinking is making me uncomfortable. You know, your stress level is not healthy. It's really negatively affecting me personally and our marriage. You know, I'm having a hard time connecting with you physically. And yet he still didn't understand why I wasn't interested in having sex. And yet I did. And then that became really unhealthy. You know, our physical interactions were really difficult for me as well. And so it just got to a point where I was physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually defeated and exhausted. And it came to a point where I no longer felt healthy. Mm -hmm. And so being young (laughs) 
And in this marriage that you thought was going to fix everything and finding out that probably at that point you felt worse than before, plus you're in the church and, and the whole concept of what a marriage is supposed to be and, and long-term and you never end and you're supposed to be some type of an example. I can only imagine what you must have been feeling at that point. I definitely felt a lot of pressure. Um, like I said, my faith is really important to me. And and at the time I was working in full-time ministry. So not only is my faith important to me, but it's also my, you know, job responsibility. And I was in positions of leadership and authority. And and honestly, that played a role in the unhealth of our relationship because he knew how strongly I felt about the covenant of marriage. And in a lot of ways, he held that against me and held oh, it over me. Because he knew you wouldn't leave. Yeah, yeah, he knew I couldn't leave. Okay. He knew I wouldn't. And honestly tried to make me think that the standards I wanted us to hold for our relationship were unrealistic. That was one of the biggest lies I've had to kind of try to unlearn is that my expectations are too high. Mm-hmm. That was something he would say to me often. And I really just had to get to a place where like, no, I just want to be treated with respect. So had you had your son yet? Or was this before or after your son? I mean, it was the whole time. The whole time. Okay. <laughs> Let's be real. Yeah. And so, you know, I was one of the first of my friends to get married um, and one of the last to have kids because I kept waiting for our relationship to get healthy so we could add, um, you know, a child. Um, and we did. And I don't want to paint this picture that we never had any good times. That's incredibly not true. Mm-hmm. But there was a lot of difficulty and then a few periods of light. And so during one of those periods of light, we did mm-hmm. have our son Lincoln. And then we did have another, you know, good year after him. And then the next two years were just really, really difficult again. And and really for me, that's kind of where I had to draw a line in the sand because as I started seeing Lincoln getting a little bit older and being able to perceive kind of the tension in the home mm-hmm. and, you know, be able to see the anxiety that he had, but also the way that anxiety impacted me and the fact that his dad would come home and, you know, pound four beers before he even gotten in the shower. Mm -hmm. I just, it got to the point where I knew I couldn't let him continue to see these things and think that they were normal. There was one day I was changing Lincoln's diaper and it just hit me that if I didn't make a stand and basically demand to be treated with respect Mm -hmm. that I would raise a man who would grow up and treat his future wife the exact same way one day. And that was the day I knew that I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. You are so right. And I think that might be around the time where I first discovered or met you. And I don't remember if it was before, like if I heard about grit and grace before I don't even remember how I became connected with you guys, to be honest with you. That's so fun. Yeah. I love that, actually. I know. But somewhere in that process, either before or after I had Grit and Grace on my radar, that's when I found you on Facebook. And I saw you were praying for your husband series, really. I mean, it was amazing. And I started watching them. And they'd come up. I guess I followed you. I don't know how it worked. But they'd start popping up in my Facebook. And I'd start looking for them. And I shared them on my professional page. And I told my clients about them. You've got to see there's this woman. And she prays for her husband every day. It's these quick little snippets. Such a great idea. Just the whole concept of taking a few minutes to focus on your husband. And a lot of what you said was just really blessed me. So now, of course, understanding that you were in the midst of a struggle in your marriage, what made you choose to start the whole series of praying for your husband? Because most people start things like that after they've gotten through the storm. You know, they're going back and lifting people up. You were in the middle of the storm and you were ministering, (laughs) helping all these married women focus on their marriages and praying for their husband. Can you tell me about that? We've never talked about that. That's so cool. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And it's funny, even as you say that, like, I guess I didn't even realize that that was different, that I was doing it while I was in it. Yes. But as I've gotten to know myself more these last couple of years, I think that that really speaks to how much I thrive when I'm in community. Mm -hmm. And because I was struggling so significantly in my home where you're supposed to feel the safest, Mm -hmm. where you're supposed to feel connected and loved, 
my personality is more toward, you know, connection and people. And so while I was struggling in those ways, I wanted to just connect with other women who might feel the same way, but not know what to do with it. And so I did have a lot of, you know, biblical training in Mm -hmm. my 10 years of ministry. I had the privilege of doing life very closely with people who I respect so much and appreciate the way they live their lives and taught me so much through their example and through their words and through just being in ministry with them. And so I wanted to share the experience of knowing biblical truths, but being in a relationship that was hard. Like, Mm -hmm. how do you apply what the Bible says to a wife in a relationship where you feel mistreated? Right. And I would hint at that while doing my Praying for Your Husband series. You know, I did an almost daily live Facebook video for two years. And again, I did it because I knew that I wasn't the only wife out there who felt like, isn't there supposed to be more to marriage? Is this all there is? And I thought my husband would do more, be more, say more something. And Mm -hmm. and I don't know what to do with these disappointments, but my biblical perspective is that God's the one who can handle all of that. And Mm -hmm. your husband most of the time can't. Mm -hmm. And that as much as we want our husbands to change, like you already said, we can't change them, but God can. Yes if he chooses to, and you know, if that's his will, he, he will. And so our number one tool in all areas of our life where we lack control, which is PS everywhere, we can pray. (laughs) And so I just said, you know what, I'll take my life experience of marriage and I'll share a little bit about something that's happening in my own life or my own marriage. And then we'll pray about it because that's the only thing I can do. And I had found the book, the power of a praying wife Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by stormy Omartian or Omardian. I don't know how to say it. I don't know either. We'll put it in the show notes. (laughs) Exactly. Great book. And she kind of guides you through praying for lots of different areas in your husband's life. And so I kind of took that concept and turned it into a community of women where people would look forward to watching my videos and they would get on and they would talk to me while I was doing it. And I Mm -hmm. loved the interaction of it. And I loved knowing that the struggles I was experiencing, one, I wasn't alone and two, somebody else could benefit from them. And honestly, it was a reminder for me every single day to take the frustration I was experiencing and turn it into an actual and earnest prayer for my husband. And I look at now, you know, I'm sure we're going to fast forward and talk about the kind of bigger thing that happened next. But I look at now and just the way that God orchestrated all of that. There are women who I will never meet Mm -hmm. who watched that video, Mm watch those videos. And I still share them now because I know that they were effective then. And there's probably somebody who needs to see them now. There are people I have never met, but I feel very connected to even to this day because of doing that series. And I know it was, it was God's plan for me. And, you know, I hope one day to continue doing it again. Can people still find that? Yeah. So thank you for Facebook memories, right? Yeah. So they come up in my memories and often I will share them. So okay. I just try to reshare them. I mean, if you go to my Facebook page and then go to my videos, mm. there might be a, like a playlist on there. Or you could look for me on YouTube for a while. I was uploading them to YouTube. Oh, Gosh, okay. that's embarrassing. If somebody went now and looked, I mean, because they're old, but <laughs> I think there's some good truth in most of them. <laughs> yes, I would definitely say so. So just look up Julie Graham. We'll put the spelling in the show notes. And yeah, and honestly, maybe you can if find you look some of those hashtag videos. Praying for your husband daily, you'll probably be able to find it because they're all public posts on right. Facebook. So we'll put that hashtag in the, in the show notes and they should be able to find them. Okay. And that was before you weren't doing it on Instagram, right? That was just Facebook. No, nope. I wish I was doing them on both. Yeah. Well, they disappear on Instagram. So what's the point? Yeah, that's true. Very <laughs> cool. Okay. So at some point in the midst of praying for your husband, things came to a head in your marriage. Yep. It got to a point where I, I remember there was a day. In fact, I think he came home while I was filming one of the videos. I mean, he knew that I did them. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he would watch and sometimes he would roll his eyes at the idea of it. But one day he came in and we were in a, we were in a really rough patch. You know, I had kind of, again, expressed how unhappy and mistreated I felt. And he acknowledged that I felt that way, but kind of made it clear that there really wasn't anything he knew he could do about it. And this Mm -hmm. just kind of was how it was. Um, So he came in and I was doing the videos and he gave me this look where I could just tell he was Mm -hmm. disgusted that I was doing it. And I just kind of had this feeling of like, I can't keep doing Mm -hmm. this it's just uncomfortable for me because I knew how quickly our marriage was spiraling downward. And then I had that moment with Lincoln and then I started having a physical reaction. The the amount of stress that I was under had started affecting me physically. And I was having significant issues Mm -hmm. with my Mm -hmm. skin on my face. 
And that's when I knew that I could not handle the conditions I was living in any longer. And I decided to ask him for a separation. How hard was that for you? Really hard. I struggled with not only fear over what he would say, what he would do, if it could work, shame, you know, does a Christian woman separate from her husband? Yeah. Guilt over how he was going to feel abandoned. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the codependency, right? Needing to take care of him. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How will he handle this? Yeah. Shame, fear, and guilt big time. Okay. But I was also clear as day. The day that it happened, you know, and someday I'll share all the details, but the day that it happened, there were some significant circumstances that it was, it was just so obvious that it was my only option at that point, honestly, for him and for me, like Mm -hmm. it had just gotten to such an unhealthy place that I knew that something had to change or he was not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so you got strong and you did it maybe even feeling weak, right? Yep. And you started walking through that process. So tell us what happened next. So I took my son, he and I found a place to live nearby. And I I told my husband, I said, you know, I want to separate from you so that we can rebuild our marriage. It's my desire to reconcile. You know, this is not a divorce. It's not even a legal separation. Mm -hmm. It's just a physical separation so that you can have some space and I can have some space to really work on what we both individually want for our own health Mm -hmm. and what we want for our marriage. And I asked him to begin some counseling and I started doing some counseling. Actually, I had already been doing counseling. I started going to a recovery group at my church and I just really started trying to unpack what had led me to the decisions I made you know, in dating and then marrying him, Mm -hmm. because I I really had this sense that I had gotten to the bottom of myself and that he needed to get to the bottom of himself if we were going to be able to rebuild our marriage. And so he did. He had a bad week where he kind of didn't believe that I was serious, that, you know, that what I thought we needed to do was necessary. But then he came around and he started doing some counseling and I could tell he was really working on himself and and I was getting some space. I, I remember feeling like my head was finally above water. When I was living separate from him, I remember feeling like, now I can breathe. Did you realize that you were single-handedly stopping a multi-generational process in your family of allowing dysfunction? No. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Well, you were, though. I mean, you, your grandmother had told you that you were going to mess up just like your mother. And the reality is, is that statistically, you know, is the likelihood of that higher? Yeah. Just because of, you know, where you came from. But you stopped it. And that's kind of rare and very difficult because it's not just a physical, you know, I'm not going to take this. It's all the emotional stuff going with it, too. So, OK. So you didn't realize exactly how strong you are in the moment. But You were making some huge changes. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. And so he responded. Yeah. He responded and he responded really well, you know, and I didn't expect him to, I had asked a couple different times in, in the 10 years that we had been married 11 years, actually at that point, we were married 11 years when we separated. And there were probably two other significant times where I thought I was drawing a line in in the sand, Mm -hmm. but I had never actually packed a bag and said, I'm out unless things, you know, and I knew I needed to make that step. And so we were making, he was making progress and we actually had went to our very first counseling appointment together, Mm -hmm. which was really intense. And his counselor asked some really direct questions that I was nervous to answer, but I went ahead and said, yeah, I'm going to be very honest because like I said, I believe that we needed to really go all the way down to ground zero Mm -hmm. and start over if we had any hope of really reconciling. And so I remember we walked out of that first counseling appointment you know how couples can kind of communicate with a look without having eyes. Yes. <laughs> yep. He looked at me and he reached back for my hand, which honestly was something was a big deal because we just were so separate that mm-hmm. he never reached for my hand anymore. And that was something I needed to see from him. You know, right. and he reached back for my hand and um, we just kind of looked at each other and we almost like shared this exchange of this is going to be really, really hard, mm-hmm. but we're going to do it. We're going to do the work. Mm-hmm. We're going to figure it out. And so we left and, you know, he went to see Lincoln. It was his night to see Lincoln in our arrangement of how we were doing things. And, you know, I went back to the condo where I was staying and the next day he went to work and um, he was actually working uh, about an hour and a half away from us at a longtime client's house of his. And I got a call that afternoon 
at about four o'clock in the afternoon, I got a call from my father-in-law that he had had an accident Mm -hmm. and um, that we needed to get over to the other coast as soon as possible because they didn't really know the terms. Um, And it turned out he had fallen from a ladder and um, they rushed him into emergency surgery to try to repair his brain. And he passed away four days later. So he had a major brain injury. Yeah. Yeah. So he fell on a Wednesday and um, we took him off the machines that next Sunday. So. And you were there when he died? Oh, yeah. 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 I call it the long day from the Wednesday to the Sunday. Mm -hmm. The days kind of all meld together. Um, Mm -hmm. But he fell on Wednesday. We knew by Friday morning that the surgery wasn't successful. He was an organ donor. And so that took a couple days to get everything lined up to see if he'd be able to donate his organs. And so we took him off the machines on Sunday morning and he passed away an hour and seven minutes later which by the way, in order to donate your organs, you have to pass away within an hour. He oh. passed away in an hour and seven minutes. And the doctor told me, well, if it had been six minutes, we probably could have done it. Oh man. They so passed okay. away one minute, one minute later, which I mean, that's God's timing. I remember, I mean, those days, the Lord was so near to me. Mm-hmm. Actually, the night before we were preparing to take him off the machines, I remember you know, it was a big deal to myself and to his parents that he was going to be an organ donor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was going to give us some sense of peace that he was going to be able to donate his organs. My mom had flown in to be with me, obviously, when the accident happened. And that night before he was going to be taken off the machines was the first night I left the hospital. I mean, mm-hmm. up to that point, I had just been, you know, sleeping in the the waiting Little room. chair, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, um, but that night, you know, it's like, I was ready, you know, Mm -hmm. and so I wanted to get a little bit of sleep before the next day because they told me he's young and healthy. It might take a while. You know, he might not pass away for another day or two. You know, we might take him off the machines and it could be a while. And so Mm -hmm. get some rest. So I remember we pulled away from the hospital and I said to my mom, you know, I'm really I'm really glad that they're going to be able to donate his organs because I want his life to matter. And I remember it was like the Lord said to me in that moment, oh, Julie, his life matters. Yes. And I, I sensed it in my spirit and I literally turned to my mom. I'm sure she thought I was crazy. The truth is, is I was exhausted. Of course. Because my crazy skin problem was going to come back to mm-hmm. stress. So I, looking back, everyone says I was really entertaining to be around. But I turned to her and I said, this just in, I think God just told me he's not going to be able to donate his organs because his life matters. Wow. So he passed away one hour and seven minutes later. And I remember being like, all right, God, you're right. His life mattered. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether or not he was able to donate his organs because being married to him for 11 and a half years was a significant part of my story. Mm -hmm. And that night before he died, that last time I went, you know, to say my final goodbye to him, I remember I was walking into his room and, you know, the last time we had seen each other and had any conversations was over that intense counseling where I had shared some hard truths with him. I had some said some things that I had prevented him from having to hear before because I didn't know if he could handle it. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to hurt him by saying how badly I really felt about the state of our marriage. And so now I'm having this last conversation with him, but my perspective had changed so much. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, on Tuesday night, I'm saying, yeah, I regret marrying you. Well, now Saturday night, I'm saying, I don't regret marrying you because it was It was God's plan for me to be your wife. It was God's plan for me to walk next to you for these years, Mm -hmm. to learn more about God, to have an opportunity to be Paul's partner in life, to be Lincoln's mom, Mm -hmm. to be standing next to him as he took his last breaths, to be with him and love him enough to tell him he had to get help during those last months. Mm -hmm. And that's also where you started to gain your strength and realize what you really deserved and that you were good enough, that you weren't too much and that you had to demand to be treated well as a wife. Yep. I'm still working on that a little bit. Well, (laughs) it's always a process, but that was the first step. Yeah. You had to have had that inkling or you wouldn't have taken those steps. So here you are, a mom, a widow, and in a place that you probably never thought you would be. You were contemplating ending the marriage and now here you are. It's done. It's over. You're a widow. And now what? 
Exactly. Now what? Mm-hmm. How many, How long has it been? It'll be two years in October. So it's been about two years, almost two years since his death. And you have partnered up with Grit and Grace. You're now the face for them. You are raising Lincoln by yourself. You're doing the single mom thing. Circus. <laughs> and it's a circus. Sure, it is. All momhood is a circus. But sure. it's especially hard when you're a single mom. And so many women look up to you. So many women are inspired by you. And my question is, what is it that you have that's allowed you not to be bitter, not to become discouraged. And I'm not saying that you don't ever feel that way, but what I'm saying is that the way that you live your life is as an encourager and a motivator. And what are those aspects that give you the ability to do that? People do ask me this. And sometimes it's hard to pinpoint because I've just always been that way. I've definitely always leaned toward positivity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember being a young girl sitting in my bedroom you know, being scared of my cousin in the other room and feeling, you know, alienated by granny, but thinking, well, it could be worse. Mm -hmm. It could be worse. And so I have a roof over my head. I have clothes to wear and food to eat. And so I'm just going to keep going. Like I'm still here and I'm going to make the most of it. So I've definitely always had that push toward positivity. I've just always done life that way. And I also have been motivated by a sense for justice, a need for Mm -hmm. justice. Okay. And so how does that play out in your life? The need for justice? I mean, I just feel like I'm the one who wants to try to fight for the right to win out. Oh, okay. So you're the fighter of the wrongs. I'm the fighter of the wrongs. Now, I mean, look at my marriage, right? right? Yes. I fought and fought and fought. And so, you know, I've taken that to unhealthy places, but I also think that that is part of the way I was able to, you know, withstand the difficulty for so long is that I just kept hoping and trusting and believing that good could come from even the hard things that I was in and that I would do whatever I could to see that happen. Mm -hmm. And where I couldn't do it, I would go to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And then when he wasn't acting or making a change, then I would just trust that maybe something in the future would change. And I would just keep pressing forward. Now there's some unhealth in all of that for sure. And I'm unlearning some of those things, but Mm -hmm. I think just that bent toward positivity and a desire for justice are the things that kind of have seen me through these circumstances. I'm always all about trying to understand better the qualities that strong women have, because you certainly would be considered a woman of strength, a strong woman. So what I'm hearing is you're talking about self-talk. You're talking about positive self-talk talking yourself up, finding the good, finding things to be grateful for, which is, I mean, research has definitely shown that that's beneficial. What do you think about the value in finding the gifts in our dark places? Do you think that when you're going through something that that's a time to look for it or do you think it's more afterwards? Yeah. I mean, if you look at my life, I definitely think I've been able to in the middle of it. In the middle. Yeah. What's the good thing happening here? In fact, almost to a fault, I have an inability to look toward the future. Mm. And I finally at 35 years old have just said, that's just how I'm wired. I don't think to the future. I maximize the present. Mm -hmm. I don't even really dwell on the past so much. I'm very much a present minded person. I think that's a gift that God has given me. And that's something I try to share with people around me that the past is behind you. You can't really be promised the future. If I've Mm -hmm. learned anything by Paul's death, it's just a reminder of like, I'm not promised tomorrow, so I'm going to maximize the moment. And so what is the good in this moment? What can I learn from in this moment? What can I change mm-hmm. about what's happening now? Like, what's my role in this thing that I'm in? Like, even with my marriage, okay, what's my role? And do I need to be getting healthier in order to make changes here? Or do I come to a place where I just can't be in it anymore because there's nothing else I can do? Right. So I just think that kind of constantly evaluating your present moment and what's the good in it, what are the changes you need to make and not dwelling on the negative or even the past. Well, I think that's such a golden nugget because whenever I'm working with clients who especially have anxiety or depression, I talk about coming back to the present because often our anxiety is about the future. Our depression is about the past, right? And if you just look at this slice of life that you're in right now, most of the time, unless you're in the midst of a trauma, things aren't that bad, right? You're okay. You're safe. You're taken care of. And so that is a quality, I think, 
that has probably helped you through. And, and thank you for sharing that with my listeners, because being able to stay present and grateful for the present moment does kind of take away a lot of that stuff, as long as you're willing to process too in the present. Yep. And I'm learning to do that better for sure. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. in the last couple of years, like just as the you know, as the chaos has subsided, as the cloud has lifted, as, you know, I've been given kind of this new opportunity to figure out who is Julie Graham, you know, what do I like? Who am I? Where do I want to go? What do I want to do different? One of the biggest things I've focused on is really trying to work through that childhood trauma that honestly, I just never had time to deal with. Mm -hmm. I just, I'm a move forward and get it done and focus on the positive. So I didn't really like focusing on the negative hard things of the past, but I've really kind of dug my heels in and said, no, I got to get through that stuff because I don't want to put myself in a position where I will settle and choose an unhealthy person again to share my life with. The stakes are too high. I can't do it again. So tell us who is Julie Graham now? (laughs) Are you trying to make me cry, Zoe? I feel like all you ever want to do is make me cry. (laughs) It's not intentional, I promise. (laughs) You know, this is something that I have been working on. I am a strong woman. Mm -hmm. I'm someone who is resilient and I am bold. I'm confident. I recognize that God has done some significant things in my life story. Like I have come to a place, you know, that phrase that you see everywhere, the struggle is part of the story. Right, yeah. I literally believe that God wants to use my life as a billboard for that truth. Mm -hmm. My life has a lot of significant, sad, hard things, and yet it doesn't define me. It allows me to connect with people in such a way to point back to God is still sovereign in the midst of all of it. And there is still good to be had, enjoyed, and, you know, look forward to in the midst of all parts of life. And so I love to have a good time. I love to laugh. I love to be silly. I really love to enjoy the present moment to the fullest. And I hope that when people look to me, they see that, yes, I'm strong, but it's because God has been with me and he continues to be with me. And I have a confidence that he will continue to be with me. And so I'm going to do everything I can to live this life to the full. So for a woman who's struggling, who's going through something really difficult, maybe it's a difficult marriage. Do you have any tips for her? Do you have any just words of advice? Someone who might not be feeling strong, like, I don't know how to do that. It's so interesting because I I look back now and I'm like, what did I say to those people? Mm. Like, I feel like I'm a little bit removed um, enough from it now that I'm like, what do I say to somebody who's in it? I mean, I know one of the biggest things for me was getting honest with somebody. If you're in an unhealthy marriage, Mm -hmm. I stayed so quiet. I wanted to respect my husband and Mm -hmm. I wanted to protect him and I wanted to speak well of him almost to a fault. I'm sure there was some shame in there too. I didn't want to tell anyone about the way things were because I was embarrassed, but also because I felt like that was the godly thing to do was to not, you know, disrespect or speak ill of my husband. But it was important for me to finally start talking about some of the things that I was experiencing because anytime I would share with somebody honestly what it was really like living in my home, they would look at me with wide eyes and usually tear up and say, it is not supposed to be that way and encourage me to get some help and encourage you know, me to ask Paul to get some help for himself and for us together. And so I think getting honest with somebody who can be safe and that if you're having any sort of gut feeling that this might be something you're experiencing, that to not ignore that and to really get serious about getting some help. Well, I know for sure that there are are women out there who are having that experience. I had a similar experience early in my marriage at that age, and I can recognize all of that in the story that you just said, the feelings that keep you from being able to share. So I know that that's beneficial to a woman. So what do people assume about you that's false or that Maybe you wish, you know, that they really understood about you. It's funny. Yesterday, I fell into a puddle of tears after I finally got Lincoln in bed. Mm. And I kind of had this feeling of like, everyone thinks I have it all together, but I'm (laughs) a hot flaming mess too. Yes. Yes. You know, and so even though I am this strong, confident person, that's not to say I never struggle. It's not to say that I don't you know, have areas where I feel incredibly weak. Mm -hmm. And I think even as I, you know, pursue, you know, dating again and looking to pair up with somebody who can recognize the beauty of me being strong, but also be there for me and my weakness. 
I didn't really feel safe to be vulnerable with Paul. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to me now that I would find somebody that I could actually fall apart in front of and then not feel like, oh, but now I have to hurry up and fix it and clean it up and like be back to managing everything. And so I know people look at me and think that I'm like this girl got it all together. (laughs) And like, it's just not true. Yeah. I just happen to be confident in the midst of it. And I know I can't do it all. So there's that. So I just, the things that I give myself to, I go all in, but I can't do it all. Right. And you're walking through it, which is what we all have to do. We have to walk through it. We're not going to all feel like we've got it all together all the time. So lastly, what does it mean to you to redefine your superwoman? Well, first of all, I love that that's your thing. Like, I love that about your show. I love listening to all of your guests share what that means. And for a second, I was like, I don't know. What does it mean to me? I have to figure out what it means to me. (laughs) And then I remembered that for me, that's be bold and just be you. Ah, love it. You know, that's something I always come back to that, like, if I'm trying to be anyone else, if I'm trying to compare myself to somebody else, if I'm listening to my own negative self-talk that I should be this and I'm not then all of that is just going to get me off course and it's going to get me anxious, depressed, Mm -hmm. you know, feeling ashamed. But if I can just tap into the gifts that I've been given, the personality that I've been given, embrace the story that has been written for me and is continuing to be written, then I can be bold and just be me because no one else is like me on this planet. No one else is like you. And so I've got a job to do by being Julie Graham Mm -hmm. and you be Zoe Shaw. And Mm -hmm. if everyone is their own individual person, this place really will be a lot more enjoyable if we would all just be bold and just be ourselves. Thank you so much. And that's so true. Love it. So what's next for Julie Graham? What is next for me? Man, well, first we got to get through this competition, right? Yes. Wait, the competition (laughs) is October? After that is ice cream. (laughs) Uh, Well, I'm loving my job at the Grit and Grace Project. Um, I'm hoping to get into doing some more speaking and maybe even, you know, um, sharing with more women about my story. Book, book, book. A book, you know, I've, (laughs) I've been advised by some people that I love and respect that maybe a book should be on my horizon. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely say that sentence once in a while that maybe I'll write a book. Yeah. I mean, I'm just continuing to focus in on Lincoln, enjoy the season of my life, see where God takes the grit and grace project, where he takes me and ultimately where he takes my story. I'm open. I want to see what he does next and I want to follow. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your strength with us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening in to the show. I hope that Julie's story was helpful for you and that you realize that you can find strength in any struggle that you're going through. Check out the Grit and Grace Project online women's magazine. They have a section called Her Story where women share their stories and share really ways that they've gained strength. Of course, my column is there. Wonderful articles. Also check out This Grit and Grace Life podcast with Julie and Darlene. Excellent podcast. I know it will bless you. Have a super week. You've been listening to The Dr. Zoe Show, redefining your superwoman with your host, Dr. Zoe Shaw. Don't forget to sign up for her monthly newsletters to get encouragement, tips, and skills for keeping your mind in the superwoman game. Connect with her now at www.drzoeshaw.com. Tell your friends and subscribe to her podcast on iTunes. Join us next time for another edition of The Dr. Zoe Show.